Welcome to St. Mark United Methodist Church in Hamilton Square, New Jersey. I'm Pastor Bob Marks, and I greet you, of those of you who are here in the sanctuary, those of you who are on Facebook Live, as well as those online via YouTube. Just a couple of announcements, scholarship applications for those graduating from high school this season and entering college in the fall are available in the Narthex. Wilderness Escape is our vacation Bible school this year. The dates are July 26 through 30. Children age three through fifth grade are invited to participate. In addition, there will be a couple summer camps that will be offered. There will be a guitar bass camp from July 12th to 16th and a choir camp offered from August 23 to 27. You can get more information about those particular camps from Bill Wiesak. We all have rejoiced to see a, a decrease in persons infected by COVID over the past few weeks, accompanied by a, a decrease in COVID restrictions. As a church, we ask for your patience as we work together on a mandatory plan for reopening which will be approved by our administrative council. Uh, in the meantime, we ask you please to uh, be with us and understand as we seek thoroughly and completely to care for the uh, safety of everyone involved. Thank you for your understanding. Watch our midweek newsletter each week, which will tell us wh where we're moving on our plan for reopening. Having made these announcements, we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning, St. Mark family. Isn't it wonderful to be here today, ready to praise God and thank him for making us part of his family? Isn't it wonderful to be in his house? Let's celebrate that. Ed's gonna take us down to the river to start that celebration.
to worship that's on the screen. All who need a place to belong. All who seek spiritual brothers and sisters. All who strive to grow in faith and love. All who are unsure and feel unworthy. Once we join the family of God, we can move closer and closer to him by getting to know him more. We now turn to a time of prayer, and I invite you to join with me in our unison prayer of confession. Gracious God, have mercy on us, for we have failed to be faithful to you, though you have been faithful to us. You share with us your wisdom, but we prefer to go our own way. Our broken relationships with you and one another have created poverty both in us and our neighbors. In your mercy, reconcile us to you and one another for the work of justice, peace, and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Let's join in silent confession. Sisters and brothers, we do not lose heart. When we call, God hears us. When we confess, God forgives us. We believe and we proclaim in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this day comes from the book of 1 Samuel. I'll be reading from chapter 8, verses 1 through 20, and verse 11, 14, and 15. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of the second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us, like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, they have rejected me, and being king over them. Just as they had done to me from the days I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of a king who will reign over you. 
He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. Cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord. And there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced gladly. One thing we know that is if we know Jesus, if we have him in our hearts, that we have love in our hearts because God is love. So we're going to sing about that and how he manages to put a little love in all of our hearts too. We are one in the spirit. We are one. Folks, I trust you recognize the uh, blessing that we have as a church in our music program. Uh, We've got a number of folks who are away today, and yet other persons have just jumped in and have led us in worship, and for that, uh, we are thankful, both for their gifts as well as their commitment to use those gifts in the service of Christ. A reminder of those of you who are online Today, uh, we will be celebrating communion uh, following the sermon. So uh, if you haven't already prepared, you may want to pick a dull time in the sermon, uh, pretty much any time in the sermon, uh, to go and make sure that you have bread or juice 
uh, tea or crackers or whatever it is that we could use as uh, communion elements. Entitled the message, Going with the Flow or Swimming Against the Current. You've heard these as a parent or from your own parent. But mom, Tommy is going. I don't care. If Tommy to told you he was going to jump off a bridge, would you go with him? I don't care if everybody's doing it. You're not everybody. In these phrases and others, our parents sought to encourage us not to bow to peer pressure and to have the fortitude to swim against the current, to stand on our own. It's easier to go with the flow and not draw attention to ourselves by standing out. An article in Psychology Today gives the following advice. Follow this rule to drastically change your life. Don't do anything just because someone else is doing it. Now, that seems obvious. But that's why it's so hard to practice. We are social animals. One of the favorite ways for us to figure out life is to look at others, see what they're doing, and decide to do the same. A couple weeks back, I was driving down a road, minding my own business. Suddenly, I encountered that the main road was blocked off. It wasn't an area I was used to, and there were no detour signs. What was I to do? I followed my time-honored practice of following the person ahead of me. Now, I had no assurance that this person knew where they were going. They may have been looking for a destination that didn't involve the detour at all. But at the risk of getting further lost, I followed the car in front of me, or even better, if a group of cars make a turn, I trust they're escorting me around the detour. In this case, it worked. Though I must confess, there are times I have realized that the person in front of me was as lost as I am. We live in a time of tremendous polarity and disagreement, maybe more so than any time in recent remembrance. There is political turmoil. It centers for me around a couple questions. What kind of country do we want to have? What kind of a nation do we want to be? What kind of government do we think is best? You see, where we disagree is whether we need a strong, centralized federal government or do we need a smaller federal bureaucracy? Do we want a federal government that guarantees and demands a minimum wage? Or do we think that the best way to encourage the economy is to emphasize free enterprise? 3,000 years ago, the Israelite people are asking the same questions. Now, Israel was not a democracy at the time. It was ruled through the office of judges. 
These judges by, were chosen by God and consulted at times of national crisis, such as warfare with their neighbors or tribal disputes. The most famous of these judges was Deborah, Gideon, and Samson. Samuel and his two good-for-nothing boys were the last in the line of judges. Samuel was getting old, and while there were those who wanted to continue the present system, the elders and leaders saw an opportunity for change, and they called for the appointing of a king. I mean, everybody else had a king. It worked for Moab and Eden and Egypt. Why not a king for Israel? A king could represent the whole nation, could provide stronger centralized leadership, and hold everyone accountable. This system of God raising up judges was antiquated and may have worked in the past when Israel was a conglomeration of 12 tribes, but now it was time for them to mature as a nation, get with the program, move on with the times. If they were going to compete with the Philistines, they'd have to move beyond this concept that God alone was their king and appoint a human king just like everyone else had appointed a human king. So the leaders tell Samuel, Samuel, my friend, you're too old. You've lost a little off the fastball. We don't want you. We don't want your sons. We want a king. You can't blame Samuel for feeling rejected. You know how it is. Someone comes up to you and says, listen, this isn't personal. But as soon as they say that, you know what follows is the most personal thing you've ever heard. You know, it's nothing personal, but the company is going in a different direction. And we no longer need your position. Nothing personal. It's nothing personal. It's not you. It's me. I just feel I need to do something different with my life, and it doesn't involve you. We can't blame Samuel for feeling rejected. He had served God and Israel faithfully from the time his mother Hannah brought him to work with Eli in the temple. After all these years of faithful service, no gold watch, no severance package, no pension program, no 401k or 403b, not even cake and punch at coffee hour. God quickly intervenes to let Samuel know that the elders are not rejecting Samuel, they are actually rejecting God. They wanted a human king in place of God who had been their king since the time of the Exodus. The leaders wanted to get on, to go with the flow, to fit in with the nations around them, to have the kind of king in which they could engrave his image on a coin without breaking a commandment. They were not rejecting Samuel. They'd lost their faith in God's ability to lead and to protect them. The leaders had forgotten one thing 
in their call for a king, just like all the nations surrounding them. The people of Israel were created to be different than other nations. They were to be distinct, set apart, holy, peculiar. They were set apart by God to be God's instruments in blessing and saving the nations. The nations are in need of salvation. They should not be Israel's model. The story is told of a father who's with his son one day and the boy announces, Dad, I want to be just like you. The father thought of all the mistakes he'd made, all the ways he had fallen short, all of the things he wished that he could go back and change, all the people whom he had hurt. He replied to his son, Son, you're my hero. Don't be like me. Be better than me. Israel was and we are created by God not to go with the flow, but to swim against the current. Now I find it interesting that God in this passage twice tells Samuel to listen to what the people are saying and comply in their wish to provide them with a king. Despite the fact that the people are rejecting God's rule in their lives, God gives them what they wish. Samuel is to warn the people that kings do one thing particularly well, and that is kings are great at taking. A king will subscript their sons into an army. A king will create a tax structure to support the national agenda. A king will demand their allegiance that had already been promised to God. They'd enter into treaties with other nations and before long, you'd not be able to tell the difference between Israel and neighboring countries. God's response here is like that of a wise parent who recognizes that at times after warning your child, you have to allow them to make their decisions and live with the consequences of their choices. All the time, as a parent, waiting to catch them when they fail. They wanted a king. Samuel warned them of what a king would demand, and God allowed them to exercise their free will. We have a similar choice, and God extends to us the same free will. We can go with the flow, seek to fit in, become like everyone else around us. Or we can swim against the current, daring to respond to a call to be set apart and different. We can model our church life based on business models, turn evangelism into marketing, and do everything possible to fade into the cultural background. If we're not careful, we'll find that in the church, the bottom line will become our king. And the almighty dollar will be almighty. 
Individually, we can set aside our understanding of right and wrong because everyone else is doing it. We can seek to be a nice church, a comfortable church, the kind of church that never expects from you more than you're willing to give. Or we can commit ourselves to swim against the cultural current. C.S. Lewis writes in the Chronicles of Narnia about the need to follow the paths that God has set before us. In one story, Aslan, the God figure, instructs a young Lucy and her brother to follow the path that he would show them. He also tells them that there are times when there will be roads that seem easier, but they won't be in the end. Always go the way that he will show them. But after Aslan is gone, there comes a time when the road Aslan had pointed out seems too difficult, and Lucy and her brother take a road that seems easier. It's where everyone else was going. It's what everyone else was doing. It's not long before the supposed shortcut leads them astray. And Aslan must come home and save them. So in a thousand different ways this day and each day, we make a decision to go with the flow or to swim against the current. Let us pray. Most gracious God, it's so easy to just follow those who are ahead of us. It's so easy, most gracious God, to to fit in. And yet, Lord, your call for us is often to be willing to stand out. We come unto you this day, most gracious God, and we thank you for your particular call on our lives, for the way in which you have called each of us to be a witness to those around us. And we're not much of a witness if we're just going along with everyone else. We pray, most gracious God, that you might continue to lead to us those who help us to grow in faith and who give us strength to stand out for Christ. We pray, most gracious God, that this day and each day that you help us not to choose the easy road, but to choose the road that's narrow. We come unto you this day and we pray for those in need of your healing and your grace. We pray for those persons in the hospital like Ryan and Leslie, we pray for those, Lord, who are recuperating and who need your strengthening each and every day. We pray for John. And we pray, dear God, for those who are dealing with the loss of a loved one. We ask that you bring comfort and strength and Just hold them up in this time of need. Lord, we pray for our nation that indeed you might lead us in ways in which we can glorify you by our common life together. We pray your healing in a broken world and ask for peace, for harmony, 
in places including the Middle East. So gracious God, as we prepare to come to your table, meet us in this place, remind us of your call to be holy, even holy, peculiar. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he gathered with disciples. And in the context of a meal, he took bread. He blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And now as the children of God, with confidence we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, those of you who are present, we invite you to peel back the cellophane cover on your elements. And we join together with the part of the congregation that's online, the body of Christ broken for you. We then remove the foil. And again, with that portion of the congregation online, take a drink. This is Christ's body broken for you. Let us pray. Most gracious and glorious God, we are reminded of your sacrifice on our behalf. In response for the saving work of Jesus Christ, We offer ourselves in service to you. Use us as you will this day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. to prevail upon you to stand we're going to do and all the people said amen we don't sit down for that song Well, it don't matter. 
brothers and sisters, we go from this place and many places. And today we make a decision over and over again. Do we just fit in with everyone else? Or do we dare swim against the current? Offer yourself this day in service to God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.